Welcome to Dr. Will's History Road Trip. Today we're going to talk about a, a figure that many of you Texans may know, but outside Texas you, you probably don't. Uh, we're going to talk about a man named Jose Antonio Navarro. Jose Antonio Navarro was one of the most consequential and important Texans of the 19th century. He was born in San Antonio in 1795, and he lived under five different flags during his lifetime. Uh, first, the flag of Spain, then Mexico, then the Republic of Texas, the United States, then the Confederate States of America, and then eventually the United States again. Navarro served as a state legislature under a state legislator under both Mexican and American rule, even served as a federal congressman in Mexico under Mexican rule. He was one of the signers of the Texas Declaration of Independence in 1836, later served on the Texas Constitutional Convention of 1845, which accepted Texas's annexation into the United States, and they also wrote a state constitution. He then served, I believe, three terms as a, a Texas state senator. Uh, when the Civil War came in 1861, Navarro supported Texas's secession from the Union. His son, Jose Angel Navarro III, actually voted for secession as part of the state legislature. Now, uh, Jose Antonio Navarro, uh, was his father was named Angel Navarro, and he was actually a native of Corsica, the same island in the Mediterranean Sea that Napoleon Bonaparte was from. Uh, Angel ran away from home at the age of 14, made his way to Mexico. By 1777, he was in San Antonio. And then in 1783, he married Maria Josefa Ruiz y Peña, the daughter of a wealthy San Antonio family. The Ruizes were very prominent in the early days of San Antonio. Actually, her brother, Jose Francisco Ruiz, was a militia commander. Angel ran a store in San Antonio. He began to raise a family. His oldest son, Jose Angel II, was born in 1784, followed by two daughters, and then Jose Antonio Navarro, the subject of this uh, video, in 1795. And then Antonio had several younger siblings as well. The Navarros were very active in local politics in San Antonio, along with their in-laws, the Ruizes. In 1790, Angel, the father, became the first elected alcalde of San Antonio. The alcaldes had previously been appointed up to this point. And the alcalde was an office in, in Spanish-speaking countries that uh, is kind of a combination of mayor and justice of the peace. Angel was re-elected several times as alcalde before he retired in 1807, a year before his death. Now, his son, uh, Jose Antonio Navarro, came of age during a time of intense change and turmoil in the Spanish Empire. Um, during the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted roughly between 1793 and, and 1815, France had invaded Spain and Portugal, this resulted in Spain's American colonies receiving a large measure of self-rule. Well, as the Napoleonic Wars were winding down, the Spanish crown reestablished control over Spain. They also wanted to reestablish more centralized control of their colonies, and that's going to cause several independence movements to spring up in Spain's American possessions. For example, on, on September the 16th, 1810, in a little town called Dolores in the state of Guanajuato, Mexico, uh, a Mexican priest named Father uh, Miguel Hidalgo raised a cry of revolution, and this is the beginning of, of the Mexican Revolution against Spain. Uh, he had an army of mestizos, uh, which are mixed Indian and Spanish race, uh, and also some Indians. He, he captures the capital of Guanajuato, starts to march on Mexico City before he got cold feet and retreated, and at that point his army left him. Uh, without getting too much into this, Father Hidalgo would, would later be caught by royalist forces as he tried to flee to Texas, and he would be executed. But the movement he, he started could not be easily contained. Now, here, here's why this is important for our story. The spirit of revolution quickly spread to San Antonio, and on uh, January the 22nd of 1811, revolutionaries led by Juan Batista de las Casas, a retired, a retired army captain, seized the Spanish governor of Texas, uh, Manuel de Sosedo, and um, declared rule by peninsulares to be over with. Peninsulares were, were 
residents of the Spanish colonies, but they were pure-blooded Spanish, and they had been born in Spain. So they're white Spaniards born in Spain. Spanish rule in, in the colonies was, was very racially stratified. At the top of the heap, you had the Peninsulares, who were from the Iberian Peninsula, hence the name. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as Gachupines, but they're pure-blooded Spaniards born in Spain. Next on the pecking order would have been the Criollos or Creoles. They would have been pure-blooded Spaniards but they were born in the colonies, so they they weren't considered as high up on, on the pecking order as Peninsulares. Below them would be Mestizos, which would be mixed Indian Spanish blood. Then you had all sorts of stratifications. There's um, you know mixed African and Indian blood, that kind of thing. And at the bottom of the heap would have been your purebred Indians. And part of what Father Hidalgo's revolt was to do was to give some measure of self-rule to especially Mestizos. Now, so Las Casas raises this revolt in San Antonio. Uh, that doesn't last long. Later, some of his men turn against him. They hand him over to the Spanish authorities who had him executed. Now, that revolt was unsuccessful. It lays the foundation for the next challenge to Spanish rule in Texas. One of Hidalgo's revolutionaries, a man named Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara, had been sent to the United States to raise money and gain support for overthrowing Spanish rule in Texas. Now, while he, he tries to get the James Madison administration interested uh, in getting involved, uh, they weren't willing to do that. But he was directed to go to New Orleans. They said, you'll be able to find some help there. And in New Orleans, Gutierrez recruited 130 Americans led by a West Point graduate named Augustus McGee. So this becomes known as the Gutierrez-McGee Expedition. They invade Spanish Texas. Initially, they're very successful. Uh, they laid siege to Presidio La Bahia in what's today Goliad, Texas, in November 1812. Um, if you go back and look at one of my earlier videos, I did an on-location video at, at Goliad. We talk about that a little bit. Uh, they defeat a royalist army at the Battle of Rocio in March 1813. But Gutierrez was a, a poor leader. A lot of the Americans began to leave his army soon afterwards, um, partly because he executed some prisoners of war after promising them safety, and, and the Americans had big problems with that. Um, eventually, Royalist forces commanded by a man named Joaquin Arredondo marched into Texas and shattered this rebel army at a battle called the Battle of Medina in August of 1813. That's the largest battle ever fought on Texas soil. Arredondo then marched into San Antonio, and executed 327 people suspected of supporting the rebels. Royalist forces conducted a similar purge in Nacogdoches. Now, here's why this is important to, to this story. The Navarro and Ruiz family, so Jose Antonio Navarro's family and, and his, his mother's family, had supported Gutierrez's revolt. They had supported um, this breakaway from Spain. So when word comes to San Antonio of the disaster at the Battle of Medina, they fled San Antonio because they knew what was coming and headed east. Um, they left Texas entirely, and the Navarros and Ruizes for three years settled close to Natchitoches, Louisiana, in the United States. By 1816, it was deemed safe enough to finally return to San Antonio. And by this point, Jose Antonio was now 21 years old, and he had come to believe that the best hope for Texas to succeed and prosper lay in Anglo colonization. Spain had never been able to successfully populate Texas uh, before Arredondo had laid waste to, to San Antonio. I think the, the biggest population Spanish Texas ever had was somewhere around 7,000. There were really only three towns of any size in Spanish Texas, San Antonio, Goliad and Nacogdoches. That meant that the area was open to constant Indian attacks. So after his experience fleeing from Arredondo and living in the United States, Navarro was convinced that attracting Anglo settlers from, from the United States into Texas was the best hope for that province to succeed and grow uh, economically as well as politically and socially. Now, a few years later in 1820, events work out to that, that kind of go in hand-in-hand hand with, with what Navarro thought should happen. 
1820, an American named Moses Austin shows up in San Antonio, and he presents a plan to the Spanish government to settle Anglo families in Texas. Many, many of those families, like Moses Austin, had lost their land and lost a lot of their fortune in the Panic of 1819, a really serious economic depression that hit the United States that year. Um, and so they, they see settling in Texas as a way to, to gain back and retrieve some of their lost fortune. Now, this plan was eventually approved by the Spanish government, but not before Moses Austin died. His son, Stephen F. Austin, continued his father's work um, and uh, in 1822 began to settle about 300 American families in Texas. Navarro became friends with Stephen F. Austin, and those two men knew each other. They were friendly. They su Navarro supported Anglo colonization because it benefited his family, and it benefited San Antonio. Navarro was a merchant. Anglo colonization represented a new, large, and comparatively wealthy market. These new colonists will also need friends who understood Spanish laws, customs, and the Spanish language. So colonization by Anglos from the United States would work out very well for Jose Antonio Navarro. Now, while Austin's colony was in the process of being planted and planned and all that, Mexico finally won its independence from Spain. After 11 years of struggle, they won their independence from Spain. Mexico is now an independent country. Texas is now part of Mexico. After a brief experiment as an empire that didn't last very long, Mexico decided to model its government after that of the United States, even adopting the official name Estado Unidos de Mexico. And in 1824, delegates from all the different Mexican states wrote a constitution, becomes known as the Constitution of 1824, which established Mexico as a federal republic, much like the United States, where states shared power with the national government. Uh, San Antonio native Erasmo Seguin served as a delegate to the um, Constitutional Convention of 1824. Um, one of the things that Seguin argued for, and most Tejanos and Anglos as well wanted, was separate statehood for Texas. They wanted Texas to be its own state. However, the population of Texas was still pretty low, and what the Constitution of 1824 did is it combined Texas with another state, in Mexico called Coahuila to become Estado de Coahuila y Tejas. So for much of its early years as part of the Mexican Republic, Texas, well, for all of its years as part of the Mexican Republic, Texas is combined with Coahuila into one state, Coahuila y Tejas. Now, shortly thereafter, Jose Antonio Navarro is elected to the state legislature of Coahuila y Tejas, which met in, in the capital of Coahuila, which would be Saltillo. He was only one of three legislators from Texas. Um, Texas only got three delegates in, in the state legislature. But one of the things Navarro did was he played a key role in keeping Anglo colonization alive in Texas. And he did this by helping, and this is controversial, by keeping slavery alive in Texas. Most of the settlers to Austin's colony came from the southern United States. Many of them were involved in large-scale cotton agriculture, and by the 1820s, that meant slave labor. Now, Mexico, they had had in the past experience with various forms of, I guess you would call it unfreedom, things like debt peonage, the hacienda system, that kind of thing, but they had never had chattel slavery as existed in the United States. Chattel slavery is the system that we know of in this country whereby you don't just own the person's labor, you own that person. That person is property. Um, the federal government of Mexico was pretty ambiguous on the subject of slavery. It really didn't exist anywhere in Mexico except in Texas. But the state constitution that was adopted by Coahuila y Tejas in 1827 seemed pretty clear on the subject. When this new state constitution was adopted in 1827, it prohibited the introduction of slaves into the state after six months and then declared that no one born in the state would ever be a slave. In September of 1827, the state legislature of Coahuila y Tejas passed a law that put that article into effect. Um, so what's going to happen is if this goes into effect and Anglos are no longer allowed to bring slaves into Texas, they're, just, they're not coming. Um, that's going to end slavery in Coahuila y Tejas, but it's also going to end Anglo colonization as well. Uh, for Navarro... 
the good of, out, of Anglo colonization outweighed the bad of slavery. So what he did is he worked with his friend Stephen F. Austin to find a way around this. In early 1828, new slaveholding settlers moving into Texas started to do this. Right before they entered Texas, when they were still in Louisiana, they would free their slaves in Louisiana and then have them sign contracts indenturing themselves in voluntary servitude for 99 years. Now, <laughs> if you're a slave, it's not really voluntary, is it? It's just a, a way to get around the law. But this is what they started to do. Navarro introduced a bill into the state legislature that said contracts made in the United States would be valid in Coahuila y Tejas. And so what this, this did was it allowed people to technically free their slaves in Louisiana, have them sign voluntary terms of indenture, and then those contracts would be honored once they got into Coahuila y Tejas. That effectively undid Article 13, which was the article in the Coahuila y Tejas Constitution that outlawed slavery. Now, it also kept Anglo colonization alive. Navarro continued to play a very important role in state politics up to the Texas Revolution. He also continued to champion Anglo immigration. In 1831, the governor of Coahuila y Tejas, uh, Governor Jose Maria Viesca, appointed Navarro to be a commissioner of the DeWitt Colony. The DeWitt Colony would be modern-day Gonzales area, Gonzales County, um, probably part, parts of uh, Goliad County, uh, parts of DeWitt County, that area as well. Um, in 1835, he was then elected as a deputy to the Mexican National Congress from Coahuila y Tejas. So he's actually going to serve in the federal Congress for a little while, but he doesn't serve a full term. In 1835, there are tensions between Texas and the national, go national government of Mexico, and they grew tense, and so he resigned that year. The reason there were tensions between Texas and the national government stemmed from the president of Mexico in 1835, President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Now, interestingly enough, Santa Ana had had, had he had been a lieutenant in Arredondo's army in 1813 when they marched in and put down that revolt and laid waste to San Antonio. So I'm sure the Navarro and Ruiz families already didn't care for him. There's even a rumor that, and I couldn't verify this, but a rumor is that Santa Ana wanted to marry Navarro's sister and the family refused because he's known to be a fellow of bad character and also he was a royalist and they were for independence. Don't know how true that is, but he becomes president of Mexico in 1835 and one of the things Santa Ana did was to abrogate the Constitution of 1824. He just got rid of it. He said no more Constitution of 1824. He replaced it with a document called the Siete Leyes or Seven Laws. What this document basically did was centralize the government of Mexico. Among other things, it abolished Mexican states. No longer would they be states. Now you'll be military departments. And instead of electing your legislature and governor, the president, Santa Ana at this point, would appoint them. Um, well, that's, that was unacceptable to, um, to Texans both Tejanos and Anglo-Texans, and they rose up in revolt. And Texas was not the only state that rose up in revolt. Yucatan and Zacatecas rose up in revolt as well. Now, Texas was the only one of those successful in resisting Santa Ana and winning, winning independence. Navarro would serve as a delegate to the Convention of 1836, which voted to declare Texas independent, and he signed the Texas Declaration of Independence on March 2nd, 1836, He's one of only three Latinos to do so. Uh, the two others were his, one was his uncle, Jose Francisco Ruiz, and Lorenzo de Zavala, a recent arrival from Yucatan, was the third. <clears throat> Later, Navarro would also serve as a senator in uh, the Republic of Texas Congress. Now, politics in the Republican Tex Republic of Texas were, was driven by, um, by personalities. There weren't political parties people tended to divide along support for certain personalities. The two biggest, per the biggest personality in the Republic of Texas was Sam Houston. 
So politics in the Republic of Texas tended to divide along the lines of you were either pro-Sam Houston or you were against Sam Houston. Navarro generally opposed Sam Houston. He, he didn't care for him. And he, he favored Texas's second president, Houston's political enemy, Mirabeau Lamar. Um, in 1841, when Lamar was president, he authorized an expedition to conquer Santa Fe and make it part of the Republic of Texas. Now, Texas claimed the Rio Grande as, as its boundary from its source up in what's today Colorado all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. That would have included Santa Fe. So they sent a military expedition to conquer it, but with that, they sent political and civil commissioners um, to try to convince the, the residents of New Mexico to secede from Mexico and join the Republic of Texas. Navarro was sent as a commissioner because of his knowledge of Spanish law and his fluency in the language. His job was to pervade Nuevo Mexicanos to secede from Mexico and join the Republic of Texas. The Santa Fe expedition was led militarily by a general in the Republic of Texas Army named Hugh McLeod, and the expedition was a disaster. Uh, they're harassed by Comanches as they crossed the Panhandle Plains. Uh, they, they weren't prepared to cross the Panhandles. Uh, that region doesn't have a, a great deal of water, and they suffered from that. A lot of them thirsted to death. Um, when they finally, the, the survivors that do make it to Santa Fe, they expected to be welcomed by the citizens of Santa Fe with open arms. Instead, the citizens of Santa Fe um, called on the governor to do something about these interlopers. They were captured by Mexican forces led by, by the governor of New Mexico, a man named uh, Armijo. Navarro and the other survivors surrendered in October of 1841 and were sent to prison in Mexico. Navarro was imprisoned in Mexico City for over two years, and then later he was sent to a very infamous prison called the Fortress uh, of San Juan Ulloa in Veracruz Harbor. It was infamous because conditions were hard, uh, harsh and it was hard to escape from. Now, uh, Navarro was probably singled out for harsh treatment by Santa Ana because of his support for independence as a Tejano. And again, the legend that... Um, that Santa Ana had wanted to marry Navarro's sister and was rebuffed, that some people think that plays a part of it. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. Santa Ana didn't need any other reason to single Navarro out other than that he was a, a Tejano who had supported independence. Santa Ana actually offered Navarro early release from prison and a position in the government of Mexico if he would pledge allegiance to Mexico. But Navarro refused and did so saying, I have sworn to be a Texan, I shall not forswear. Originally, he was sentenced to death, but his sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. Now, in, in 1845, Santa Ana was overthrown again. The, Santa Ana would be president of Mexico on 11 different occasions. He he's, takes over, and then he's overthrown, and then he takes over. I mean, it happens 11 different times. And after he was overthrown... Some Mexican army officers helped Navarro escape. Um, they, local officers there in Veracruz, they helped him escape first to Havana, Cuba, and from Havana then he's able to go to New Orleans and then go to Galveston. Navarro continued to grow his reputation among Texans, both Anglo and Tejano, because he spent a lot of his personal fortune ransoming the prisoners from, from the Santa Fe expedition. He spent a lot of money sending to Mexico to, to get some of these people out of jail. Shortly after returning to Texas, Navarro was called upon to serve his community again. In 1845, the United States extended an offer of annexation to Texas, and Navarro was elected as a delegate from San Antonio to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, this convention voted on annexation and then proceeded to draft a state constitution. So they voted to join the United States, and then the next job was to draft a constitution for the new state of Texas. Navarro was the only Tejano delegate at this convention, and he was very instrumental in protecting the rights of Tejanos. There were some factions, mostly recent arrivals to Texas, that wanted to limit suffrage. They wanted to limit voting to what they called, quote, the free white population, end quote. And that would have excluded Tejanos. Um, Don Jose, as he was called by this point, a term of respect, uh, made several speeches on the floor of the convention about this. He considered those proposals, quote, odious and ridiculous, end quote. Um, and he was able to maintain voting rights for Tejanos 
in the convention, uh, in the Constitution of 1845. Then after statehood, uh, Navarro would serve three terms in the Texas State Senate. So he, he served his community in the state legislature. Now, Navarro largely retired from public office after the 1840s, but he remained active in his law practice in San Antonio and his mercantile business as well. He also owned several ranches in the county around counties around San Antonio. And then in 1853, um, he wrote a series of articles for the San Antonio Ledger about the revolutionary activities he had witnessed in 1813 and 1814. Um, and that helped preserve a lot of the first-person memory of those events. Those reminiscences were subsequently published in book form, which was called, uh, quote, In Defense of Mexican Valor, end quote. In 1861, Navarro supported Texas's secession from the United States. All four of his sons served in the Confederate Army, two rising to the rank of captain. Uh, but Navarro, at this point, had pretty largely retired from public life. He would die in San Antonio on January the 13th, 1871. Uh, he's buried next to his wife today in, in San Fernando Cemetery in San Antonio. And he, today he's largely honored by Texas. His, his home in San Antonio is a Texas uh, state historical site that you can go visit if you're ever in San Antonio and you visit the, the Alamo and the historical sites downtown. Not far away is Navarro's home, and it's been turned into a historical site. It's a good museum detailing his life. Uh, the state of Texas named uh, a county after him. Navarro County in northeast Texas is named for him. And the county seat of Navarro County is called Corsicana, which was named in honor of his father's birthplace, Corsica, an island in the Mediterranean that he was from. So while many people outside of Texas may not know much about Jose Antonio Navarro, very important figure, and you can see that the man dedicated his life to public service um, under what, whatever, he dedicated his life to his local community, whether that was in breaking away from Spain, in breaking away from Mexico when he, when he thought Mexico was, was a threat to, to Texas's liberty, later in breaking away from the United States in supporting secession. Um, Jose Antonio Navarro was a, a Texan's Texan, and he always supported his, his local community and his, his state above all else. Okay. Thank you for this, uh, watching this edition of Dr. Will's History Road Trip. See you next time. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Dr. Will's History Road Trip. If you like what I'm doing and want to continue following, please subscribe to my channel and click the notification button so you'll get updates when I post new content. Also, please consider supporting me via PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. Your support will enable me to go to interesting places and film them and talk about them with you. Feel free to suggest locations that you might like to see me visit in the comments below. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the road.